marvelous and strange. The illuminations are sometimes exquisitely beautiful, as this gilded page from a Judaic text dating from 1482. At other times, a bewildering mass of decoration and creatures, as this from a book of Psalms dated 1330. But dig deeper, for the real treasure is often just a small element on a page, such as these lovers in April, or this richly decorated bee with a wonderful angry animal seen best if our bee is lying on its side, or a glimpse of bunnies in their warren, squeezed between two lines of text. Welcome to the amazing world of medieval illuminations. Music is constantly celebrated, and here a dancing dog as well. From 1330, music again, and dancing, with a group of women watching from above. One wears a risque flying veil, also known as the Devil's Sails. All of this at the city gates of noble Constantinople, or so says the title, an oblique reference to the Crusades which were still being fought. But the city, as you can see, is depicted as an English medieval town, with delightful details such as the cockerel weather vane on top of the church. Celebrating the month of April in 1480, a dog cheerfully sits up as a shepherd plays his flute, and almost as clear as a photograph we can see the herd of sheep, the trees, the manor house, and the far hills. All this so extraordinary when one realizes this rondelle measures just over one and a quarter inches in diameter, or 3.5 centimeters. And from the same book of ours, a similar rondelle for the month of July, a glorious scene of four young boys bathing naked in the river, their clothes on the bank, one shivering with cold, and another either being taught how to swim or just about to be dunked below the surface. Whales fascinated, of course, they were big. In bestiaries, books about animals in medieval times, they'd show pictures of a whale appearing almost like an island, with a ship drawn up next to it, and as you can see, people cooking meals. The story went that then when they got upset, they reared out of the water, throwing everything in the air and swallowing it whole. Tales of Alexander the Great and his imaginary deeds were hugely popular, and the images are superb. Elephants were always a challenge to artists, as you can see here, as they are being presented to him as gifts. The next scene is wonderfully inventive, but also rather complicated. Alexander wanted to go to the bottom of the sea in a glass bubble. He took with him a rooster to tell the time, and a cat, because as everyone in medieval times knew, a cat breathes in sour air and breathes out purified air, a sort of oxygen machine. However, his wife tried to kill him by cutting the rope. Alexander swiftly killed the cat, and the bubble bounced back to the surface. Huh? You asked? What happened? Well, you see, everyone in medieval times knew the sea would always reject and push back to the surface anything dead. Thus, the poor pussycat saved Alexander's life. What happened to his wife? Ah, uh, I have never found out. A quite beautiful example of micrographia, a unique form of expression in Judaic texts. 
In the centre, a scallop design and petals, which are formed by a minute script, which is also a poem. Medieval amusements. We have arm wrestling, and in the Middle Ages, they had foot wrestling. Before we began, I asked you to look at a tiny image on your program. It came from a book of ours created in 1328 for Queen Jean d'Evreux, wife of the King of France, Charles IV, and it is a stunning example of miniaturism. The image is from after Jesus' birth, with Joseph leading the donkey and Mary holding her baby. What is extraordinary are the expressions so precisely detailed in their faces. The gentle concern of Mary, Joseph half looking back, and even the donkey looking up at its precious burden. As we slip down the page, an angel seems to puff bellows to light the fire in a bowl held by a monkey. On the other side, a bishop plays a harp and down below kings topple from their pedestals, seemingly in recognition of the baby king above. The soldiers remind us that he is and will be hunted to the end of his life. So small and so perfect, I just hope Jean d'Evreux had eyesight good enough to be able to enjoy it. Dragons are everywhere. They are the devil in disguise. We see them fighting each other, knights fighting with them, and please notice how colorful this dragon is. And here they enter the bedroom of a young lady as a warning. She is beautifying herself, using a mirror and comb, heinous crimes in the eyes of some. And then, of course, there's St. George and the dragon. He holds the dragon, who's alive, on a leash, the damsel's girdle, and seems to be saying to her, Why don't you take him home? He's quite well trained, you know. However, this is the prize of dragon images. In medieval times, worm was a euphemism for dragon. And the joke is on the poor old rooster, who caught a worm, then saw the wings and realized it was a dragon. Charles, Duke d'Orléans, a captive in the Tower of London. He was captured by the English at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415 and remained a prisoner for 24 years. During that time, he wrote poetry, lots of it. These images come from a manuscript of his work. He is also said to have written the first Valentine, a poem to his wife in France, where he calls her Ma très douce Valentine. Intimate Moments we begin with two lovers charmingly seated on the grass beneath a tree and here on horseback. They gaze adoringly at each other, and so do the horses. But it's the little dog on the lady's lap that brings this alive, snarling at a suitor. And who hasn't known a little dog like that? The next image is from a book of Psalms. The first time I saw it, I was horrified. But put in context, it is a comment on the very bad behavior in the cloisters at that time. It's rude and lewd, but, well, funny. Such absurdities are common in Psalters. And it wasn't just the monks who behaved badly. The nuns, too, liked a little bit of slap and tickle. And then we have this perplexing image of a nun admonishing a cloaked gentleman with half of him scraped away. Does so wonder why? And in this same Psalter, monsters, 
men and baboons bare their bums, and hardly a page goes by without someone or something flaunting a bottom. It's so absurd, I kept turning the pages and wondering what would be on the next. Scholars agree they were meant to amuse. Absurdly bad behavior was the antithesis of religious meditation. Like schoolchildren, they enjoyed a really good bit of bathroom humor. Look carefully. You can see the illuminated D for Deo, or God, looks a bit like a little dog. And he's biting the fingers of the gentleman in the margins, who looks a little surprised when wonders what he'd done. You remember the nifty knight and the wild woman from the poster? Well, this is about the document in which they appear. Here is a map of Italy, and way up in the north you can see Prato right next to Florence. Then travel 500 kilometers south, and you come to the Kingdom of Naples and the city of Naples. In 1326, Prato did not want to become a part of the Republic of Florence and so had written a document to Robert of Anjou, King of Naples, asking if they could come under his sovereignty. On the first page, it shows Robert on his throne, with all his connections to other royals nailed to the wall behind him. And on the other page, there is a lady leaning forward, just about to fall on her face. She, interestingly, is Italy and she wants him to reunite all of Italy and get the Pope back from Avignon. But Robert was having none of that, although he would take on Prato. But sadly, it was a short relationship. It began in 1326, and then in 1351, Joanna, his mercurial daughter, acceded to the throne. And about the first thing she did was sell Prato back to Florence for the sum of 17,500 gold florins. And then she invited that lovely lady, who was supposed to be Florence, down to her palace, and they had a wonderful party. From the Bedford Hours, about 1420, King Clovis of the Franks converts to Christianity in 508 AD and is depicted at that moment when the fleur-de-lis, the symbol of France, is miraculously blazoned on his shield by an anointing angel. At his feet, a small dog looks adoringly up at his master. Painted in, one wonders, at the personal request of the French royal patron who commissioned this document. A beastery from 1230. They were really very popular because they used depictions of animals and birds and mythic creatures like dragons and put moral teachings to them. An example, a stork holding a stone in its claw to make it stay awake. And the moral teaching? Reminding Christians to ever stay alert to the temptations of the devil. In closing, two images from one of the greatest illuminated manuscripts, Les Très Riches Eux, created over five years from 1410 to 1415 for Jean Duc de Berry, a brother of the King of France. This is the month of July, with a wonderful astrological dome at the top, and below a bucolic scene with peasants mowing a field and shearing sheep. And the chateau in the background was one of sixteen that the Duke owned. Our second scene is the month of April, 
with another of the Duke's chateaus in the background, and celebrating a springtime event, an engagement. In the red hat and blue cloak we meet again the Duke d'Orléans, as he becomes affianced to his first wife, Bonne, wearing a lovely black hat with feathers. Both of them were related to the Duke. They would marry, but it was only a few years before he became a prisoner of the English, and he never saw his beloved Bonne again. And it was to her that he wrote his valentine. Our closing image is a poignant yet beautiful scene from long, long ago, and from one of the most extraordinary illuminated manuscripts of medieval times.